Hosting provided by Host Tornado. They offer website hosting packages, dedicated servers, and VPS solutions. HostT.net. Programming Throwdown, episode 24. Some JVM languages, Jython, Clojure, and Scala. Take it away, Jason. Hey, how's it going, everybody? We're back. Longest episode title so far. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what we're going for. We are uh, breaking records left and right. Um, so, yeah, we, we actually, you know, I think it's been a little while since we did a programming language show. Because, yeah. you know, we had the mailbag and then we had... Uh, you know, the Hadoop framework, and so it's pretty cool. We're actually going to cover three languages. Make up for and it. And it hits you with, yeah. Sure. Yeah, one, two, three punch combo. S- say what you want. But, uh, <laughs> Save judgment until the end, sir. <laughs> we have a question from uh, Roger, actually, out in the audience that we wanted to kick off the show with. We have an audience? We have an audience. Actually, we, well, we know we have Roger. I don't oh, okay. know if we have an audience. No, we do. We get, we get email from audience. a couple of loyal <laughs> listeners. <laughs> no, yeah, we definitely, and we definitely appreciate the email questions. And, and comments, comments on uh, yeah. our G plus posts and stuff. Yeah, totally. It's good to see the communities living, thriving. Um, thanks for checking out the books too and all that good stuff and the tools of the show and hope that we can keep, you know, giving you guys some, some expert It must advice. be the new year. You sound very... Uh, Insightful, like you've been thinking about this or something. Yeah, I mean, I had that whole like you know Christmas break to just kind of reflect and. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, so, Roger. All right. So Roger had a question. His question is, do you guys ever feel behind in work? For example, I have a job where I code in C and Java, but lately I feel like I'm falling behind the whole web movement. I try to work on side projects to help keep up. So I'll I'll, I'll take first stab at this. This okay. is easy. Yes. <laughs> yes, you feel yeah, behind. Well, he said he feel, but yes. Okay, well, so like there I guess, go, Roger. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Um, so there's a couple ways to kind of, I mean, guess at what, what, he, what Roger's saying here. But I mean, first is we all are very, very busy, mm-hmm. and you know, often that that's kind of the joke, right? It's a good thing. If you weren't busy, you should be scared, right? Like, yeah, totally. You might might not be working at that place for much longer. So being busy is like very like normal. It's good, and then also, I mean, we work in a world where people don't necessarily understand programming so many of us work for people who aren't engineers or technical or programmers and they have a very hard time understanding that kind of workflow that we have um, and then even uh, even if you do work for those people engineering software engineering is still relatively new so this whole idea of estimating how much stuff should take and how many people to put on something we're just still not really that good at yeah and absolutely. so I, and, and everything is so new and different and you don't know what obstacles you're going to run into so often you find yourself overloaded at work. I mean, this is very common. Yeah, and I mean, a lot of people, you know, feel like, oh, I'm coding in, like, assembly for this Motorola chip for the to power a traffic light or something like that. It's like, I should be working on, like, doing stuff in the web using some crazy high-level language and all these things. And big data, I'm hearing that's the latest thing and all that. And so, you know, I think that there is something to be said for sort of just really diving deep into technology. Even if that technology isn't the latest, greatest thing, you could still get, have a lot of experience just on, you know, something that you're working on now. And uh, there's still a lot of value there, right? So you shouldn't worry so much about, oh, I'm not doing the latest thing, right, that I'm reading about in the news because the latest thing will, will get old. Either the latest thing will get old or it will die, right? Neither <laughs> of those two are, are very good. So, uh, you know, in general, wow, that, there's, that, was there's, deep. <laughs> that was deep. That was deep, Jason. But, but yeah, I mean, I think that his point, which is very salient too, is just to continue to do side projects and keep yourself up to but date. But it's hard to find time with that. You have life, you have yeah. work. So, so you can be overwhelmed at work, like I was discussing, you know, and just feel bad and then not have time for the other stuff. Or even the other way, Jason's interpretation of this, like feeling behind and that you're not working on the latest and greatest. But, I mean, for the most part, that's always going to be the case. Some companies kind of pick a thing and stick with it. Mm-hmm. And so you're even if you worked on that cutting edge company, working on that cutting edge thing, likely in two, three, four, five years, that thing is now the mature, safe project that everybody's using, right? Yep. And, and you would have to like, I, this would be a dangerous thing if you always had to work on the cutting edge thing. So I do think it is important to have some level of side projects or reading or watching YouTube videos or trying to just learn new language, I mean, whatever it is, you know, to try to stimulate that, you know, keep your brain working and, and learning. Yeah, I mean, I, like right now, at least from what I've been reading, Ruby on Rails is kind of like the big buzzword, you know, it's like the hot Dude, I the think that was thing. like like years ago. 
Well, what's the hot thing now? I think like I mean, it's even past it's like to Node JS, and then now even that's a year or two old, so it's even past that. Oh man, I'm falling behind. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think actually my side. I mean, it's not exactly the same, right? But I mean, like the buzzwords keep like. I mean, it's always going to be something new. Yeah, yeah. And, and that you, I think I'm about three moving. to five years behind. Okay. Like uh, I'm yeah. probably farther than that. I just know what they are. I have no idea no. To, how but, to do uh, them. But yeah, I mean, you know, you know, knowing about the latest and greatest thing is good. And having that breadth is good. But it's not something to really worry about. Um, and like Patrick said, there's. So, but what if what if he's still programming in COBOL? If he's still programming in COBOL, well, he's good. He's watching the show or listening Let's to the show. The show. <laughs> so, but I mean, and there's a limit to it, right? Like, so if the language, yeah, with anything, you know, we don't know the situation. You just got to do the best you can. We, mm-hmm. we feel you. We understand yeah. the pain you're in. But I mean, you got to kind of, if you're using a language that not, nothing wrong with COBOL, there's, you know, lots of good money, I'm sure to be made working jobs where you program in COBOL. Yep. But there's a balance of like, you know, understanding what risks and things you're taking on. And if you're working in a language or environment that is still being used by newer stuff, then you're probably pretty much okay. So you think of like Java, C++, even C, right? These things are still being used actively today. So that's still a fertile field and you shouldn't be too scared. But if you are on something that basically it's all maintenance all the time, that's dangerous because if you know and that's like your thing and you're gonna embrace it, great. But otherwise, those number of projects still on that are going to get smaller and smaller to some level. Yeah. And so that's risky. And then also you don't learn that how to kind of code brand new things because you're just stuck in maintenance all the time. Yeah, yeah. And to Patrick's point, just to say it a different way, um, it really depends on what you're working on much more than the language, right? Like, I mean, you could be doing... So I do a lot of C++ and C++ isn't like the newest, sexiest language. But I feel like I'm working on something that is pretty new and interesting, right? And so that's really the thing you should look for. Wait, but there just became like C++ OX, right? It just like, oh, that's, yeah. that's new, right? Yeah, we haven't we haven't moved to that yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> Actually, I take it back. I think C++ OX is supported, but I don't know it yet. So I know uh, like, I know a few things, but but nothing, nothing too big. But yeah, so, but you know, to Patrick's point, the uh, if you're happy with your job and you're doing some fun, interesting things, that's really what matters. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's good that you're doing the side project so that if the job does get stale for you, you can go and you'll you'll have the latest tech under your belt. So, moving on to our news, that we uh, last week was the Consumer Electronics Show. Mm-hmm. So we uh, have a little bit of delay from when we record this to when we release it, but we feel like this discussion will still be interesting. Yeah, so there was a bunch of new products, things for you to spend all of that hard-earned money that you're making. Uh, while writing in your programming languages, <laughs> like what are you going to spend them on in another year, right? So that's what the <laughs> that's what CES will will show you. There's all sorts of new announcements, but I wanted to pick up on a couple because it I know kind of carries forward a thread that I guess uh, has been in many of our shows and, and we've been interested in talking about with things like uh, the new new consoles and the Ouya mm-hmm. and these kind of things, which there was some you know some stuff about Ouya came out, but there was a couple of big name companies which aren't traditionally known for doing. Uh, console or portable gaming stuff had announcements about that. And the first one is this has been rumored for a long time, but Steam finally confirmed that they've been working closely with a hardware manufacturer to release what people have been calling the Steam Box. This is a hardware that will run Steam games. It's, I guess one of them is called Piston. And I watched an interview with uh, the guy from Steam, and he was saying that you know there's actually a whole family of products they have planned, and you know kind of like a whole uh, change of things that they have envisioned and some of it is pretty cool some of it's kind of crazy and out there but definitely sounds interesting because this is gonna be a direct competitor to whatever the next xbox and next playstation uh yeah totally. i don't know it'll already probably be surpassing the wii u i don't know how much of a competitor the wii no i'm just kidding i don't know anything about the <laughs> yeah. wii u it already has twice the specs or whatever um, <laughs> so but yeah but i mean it's gonna be able to run it's so um Steam's official version or their partnered version or their I don't know if this would be maybe like Google does with the Android phones they have like a Nexus maybe oh, Steam I will see. have kind of like this is our current endorsed platform um, I mean not a ton of details are, are out but it his the he said the Steam one is going to run Linux and it's going to run all the current Steam games so like if oh, you have Steam nice. they have to introduce this big screen mode. Oh, yeah, I've seen that. Yeah. yeah. So like, you'll be able to hook it up to your TV and run it. And then they're really focusing, he said, on doing some really awesome peripherals. So um, controllers and stuff that have really oh, like low the latency. guitar for Guitar No, Hero I don't or... think like that. Oh, so he's okay. actually kind of saying 
the new thing is to move into for the Wii U and Connect and the PlayStation Move, right? All these things like he said those are if you think about it really low bandwidth input to the system. Mm-hmm. So you have to wiggle your arms around or do a dance, but it's really hard, especially if you're trying to do precise movements. He's like so that like why worry about that? Like don't that, eh, he kind of call that stuff a fad. Ah, I see. Uh, you know, and so he's saying he wants to make like a you know, con- wireless control that's like really, really low latency and really precise and just, oh, okay. you know, works really well. And so I was, it makes I, me think the console era is going to die. I mean, like, well, why would PlayStation make a PS4 when they have to compete with Steam, which gets all the PC users? And but maybe I'm thinking we're going to more a hybrid approach. Right, so the because oh, this the, is a console. Yeah, it is a yeah, co- yeah, it's yeah. a box. You buy, you don't build, right? Yeah, you don't right, right. go to Dell and run Windows. I mean, for the most part, there's going to be someone controlling pretty much the end to end kind of stuff on it. Yeah, which is the sense. nature of the console, right? Uh, yeah, I guess it's true. The really the only difference between a console and a PC is that a PC has different expectations for the user. Like you're expected to upgrade the OS and things like that. But I mean, this thing which really blurs the lines. I mean, if they have their own OS that they keep up to date and things like that, and you just play the games on it, then uh, and you don't have root access or whatever, then uh, I guess it, it's technically a console, yeah. even though it runs effectively like Win- Linux. So. Yeah, so uh, it'll be interesting to see. It's going to be interesting times, but that was kind of cool. And you also had some comments about biometrics as inputs. And so I started kind uh, of like speculating with some friends, like what kind of stuff. And one thing I thought of, so, so you have to let me know what you think about this. So they have this idea of the galvanic skin response. So okay. this is the conductivity of your skin. So it changes in response to stress. Okay. So if you do a lie detector test, I've never done a lie detector test, but one of the things they measure is this, this thing. So it's known like if you get stressed out, I guess your skin starts to kind of sweat. And so salt is conductive. So your skin ah. becomes more conductive. Something like that. Yeah. I, I'm, I have no idea. I'm, I'm, this is kind of like, I probably got this completely wrong. That makes wrong. sense, yeah. But so if you could measure how stressed somebody was, think about like, just cool things. You, so we, we started with this and like, fun. what kind of cool game idea? So we, we thought of one was, you know, if you had like a horror game and if you got too stressed, right, then essentially you would like, <laughs> you, it, would it, lose. you would lose. <laughs> <laughs> so you had to like do really like, pers- like cutting wires on a bomb. But like if you got too stressed and nervous about it, you know, the bomb would just blow up. <laughs> yeah. Right? So okay, like, maybe totally that's awesome. kind of cheesy. It's like a staring contest. You ever do the staring contest and uh, this is from Conan O'Brien. Uh, it was a skit he did with uh, with Andy, the co-host, where, where they would stare at each other and then like crazy things would happen behind Conan's head where he couldn't see it, but the other guy could. And uh, like people would run out n- half naked and all this stuff, and then eventually the guy would lose because something so crazy would happen. You know? Okay. You could totally do this. Like you stare at the screen, it just shows you more and more crazy. Yeah. <laughs> then it shows you Gundam style, and you're like, oh, oh. hands get really sweaty. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, so, I, but also interesting would be even as like uh, you know, of course with user disclosure or whatever. But it'd be interesting if you're even just testing a game to see what parts are making people most stressed so you could optimize uh, it. Or even the game could learn what stresses you the most, like a guy popping around a corner or like a really huge, you know, lumbering guy down the hall, slow zombies or fast zombies? Yeah, you know, which yeah. ones really get to you? And then the game could kind of almost like, you know, tailor itself to what you're most scared or least scared. Like you're, you're really stressed so it stops doing those things because it's trying to be a pleasant experience. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty I cool. I don't know. It's like, I don't know. My head was spinning but that was one crazy <laughs> conversation we had. That's totally awesome. So this other article is on the NVIDIA Portable. It's a portable handheld PC and uh, it looks pretty cool. Um, it look, it's this is an NVIDIA Shield? Project Shield? Yeah, Project Shield. It's like a controller and then it the con- it looks it looks like you're holding a controller and that's it. But the top of the controller actually flips open, kind of like a flip phone, and uh, there's a screen. And so just by having something that effectively fits in your pocket, you can play um, all of these games. So this is like a is an almost it's just an Android handheld, but instead of being a phone or tablet, I mean it's meant for gaming. It is a, a game controller, like you know that's the form factor there. Yeah. But yeah. they're doing some really clever stuff with it. So first of all, the platform is pretty powerful, so you can play really good Android games on it. But then they introduced, uh, related to this, um, this concept of streaming the games from your PC. So you could have a PC in my house, like upstairs, running, and they also talked about Steam games. Uh. And you can actually, you know, your input would go to that thing, and then your go to that computer, and then that computer would also stream 
the video back to your device if you had the right video it's kind card of like for that it. cloud so that yeah, cloud it's, it, thing. this exactly on live yeah. so it's yeah, like on live but the difference is you don't go to the cloud it's in your house right, right so like the processing is local and in the demo they were showing it was actually hooked up over ethernet uh, they were saying because it was a noisy wi-fi environment but they envisioned this working really well you know and how cool is that right like how often awesome. you like try to be downstairs like you know just doing something else or you don't have you don't want to go sit at your computer where and at least for me it's, it's kind of like you nobody else is allowed to interact with you during that time right like yeah, you're kind yeah. of doing your thing you're on the computer but if you could sit there with a little handheld on the couch right you know just kind of playing around that'd be really cool yeah this is super fun and does it work as a phone too or no oh I don't know oh okay I, I didn't read but, but it runs I would, Android it might I wouldn't think so. Yeah, it doesn't look like it has a receiver or anything like that. So. so I thought this was really interesting. And then they talked about this in combination with the Steam box, right? So if you ah. think about this, like if you pair this one-two punch thing, right? Then it's basically like a Wii U. But, like, Wii U. but I actually want one, both of them <laughs> as opposed to the Wii U I have no desire to own. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This and, is pretty awesome. So, I mean, that, but and then even from this wireless device, if, if you had, if NVIDIA did this well, right? And it's what others are already starting to do. And I feel like this is going to be a huge, like, new thing this year or yeah. next year. Is like you have, like, AirPlay on the, you know, Apple devices. So you you have the Apple TV hooked up to your TV. The Apple TV hooked up to your TV. Right, Which right. effectively becomes a monitor. Mm -hmm. And then you can mirror what's on your iPad or iPhone. Android's, you know, I'm sure has got something similar or, or is in the world. You know, they're going to have that. Yep. This gets to almost the same thing, right? If you have this controller and some stick that I can plug into my TV, and then all my devices can talk to it, this I don't know. It'd be totally awesome. About. Yeah, this actually makes I, me excited. I would love to have you. the other thing too is I would love to have like party games where just people could come over and bring their controller, and and you could just do like because this controller actually has a screen, so you could do things like you could play like five card stud poker and your cards well, we your like, or trivia think about like a trivia game yeah like yeah. just people pull out their iPhones or Androids right and you just like you know buzzing in or you have this one yeah know, that'd be yeah super awesome pretty awesome I don't know so maybe I get a little too excited about this no no I think this is great I think this is super cool can you buy one now or no no oh not yet do so okay. things coming out in the near future the near future the near future the year theoretically <laughs> So, okay. last article is NASA pays $17.8 million for an inflatable International Space Station expansion. This is like something straight out of science fiction book. <laughs> this, so, I this was telling a awesome. coworker about this uh, Bigelow Space, Bigelow Airspace. Mm -hmm. This is a guy who owned a, uh, a hotel chain, and he has like a whole company kind of like you hear about Elon Musk and SpaceX about yeah. getting stuff to space like building space rockets this guy is essentially the same thing but he wants to build space hotels ah. so he has um, this concept of the like Kevlar and carbon fiber or whatever these flexible fabrics you pack them down you send them up into space and then you you know inflate them with air tanks or whatever and then it becomes a habitable environment so it's small and then you don't have to pay all this because in, in space you don't have the same requirements as a building on earth the way gravity works and stuff. Right. So, so you can design the, the assumptions very differently. And oh, now NASA genius. now NASA apparently wants to like so the full details aren't out yet. They don't come out till tomorrow. Oh okay. but the you know wanna people are speculating like a storage unit for the space station. So I'll send this up and then attach it. It's, that's crazy, yeah, this is right? Totally awesome. I mean it's a great idea, right? The only thing is how do you get that much oxygen up there? I guess you have to make many trips. Well, so I mean, so I, I would. I, I'm not a space engineer. I'm not a rocket scientist. <laughs> I'm not. Right. I only play one on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I would think like you could compress it fairly well, so the oxygen itself probably oh, doesn't yeah. weigh that much. Gotcha. Or the air mixture doesn't weigh that much, so you can compress it to a very high psi, store it in you know essentially a tank, like a liquid form or something. Well, I mean, even just to like you know think like a scuba tank, right? Like if you were to expand, I don't know how pressurized a scuba tank is, but if you took a scuba tank that was just, I assume, pretty pressurized, mm -hmm. and you expanded it to normal, you know, earth air pressure, it probably is much, much larger volume. Yeah, that makes sense. So here we are cool. speculating about stuff. Totally we should awesome. probably know this before we talk about these things. Well, <laughs> nobody knows. It's not out yet. It's we'll have to find out tomorrow. So, so stay tuned. But how cool is that? Like, I mean, so for you, was like space a big thing growing up? Like, did you were you into like rockets and um, like thinking about being an astronaut? No, I never. I actually, so, so I don't know, maybe my parents are wacky, but, but we used to go to like medieval fairs and things like that. It's like, so you wanted to be a knight, not an astronaut. Yeah, if you had to choose. Yeah. My, really? They, I didn't actually want to be either. I felt like both were pretty dangerous, but. <laughs> <laughs> 
but uh, but yeah, I never got into the space thing. But uh, but I can appreciate it. I mean, I think something like this seems really cool. The fact that you bring up a suit. So I have a question for you: Would you go to space? space station. I would totally go to space. I would like how much how much personal sacrifice would you do to go to space? Oh wow! So like let's say, like, you know people we were having so, this conversation. I was like, oh, I would go to like I think it'd be really cool to go to space. I wouldn't you know spend the amount of money they're talking about. I don't have that much money to spend yeah. to kind of go up to space. But if it became cheap enough, like you know a vacation like I would take now kind of cost to go. Sure, I'd go. Yeah, but I'll, other people are saying no. I would like. There's no way. The risk will never be low enough. Like oh. it's too dangerous. Like they just are scared of like the nauseousness they're sure they would endure. If you don't like it, oh, wow. you're going somewhere a very, very different environment, right? Like if you go there and you're just like, you know, I don't mean to be graphic, but you're just sick the whole time. It's gonna be really miserable. It's not like you could just go back. Yeah. It's like kind of like the Midwest. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, but, but I don't think, I, I didn't realize there was such high risks. Well, I mean, you're going for most current designs. You're on top of something with a giant explosive, right? So, I mean, a rocket engine is basically just oh, a controlled yeah, explosion. True. So you're attaching yourself to a giant explosion. I wonder though, like, trying to get the out percentage. Of Earth. I wonder what the percentage of planes that crash versus rockets is. Oh, explode. I think it's far higher for rockets oh, is it? currently because okay. the volume is so low. There's not that many. But I can only think of two rockets. Oh, oh no, 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 more no, rockets. No. I can only think of two space shuttles that have exploded. Well, there have out of how many? Two. Let's say there's I mean, this, one. This is bad. Was there, two there was like a year five or right? something? But there was like five total and two of them had catastrophic failures? No, but but that's how many units, not how many flights. Okay, I mean, I, we could look it up. This is kind of actually really great. Actually, it's probably, it, it's probably still much more risky than an airplane. Because you think about how many airplanes there are and there's not even a crash every day, right? There's, so, yeah, I mean, it's very rare for there to be a complete fatality yeah. kind of crash. Yeah, I guess it is quite risky. It's very, very risky. Yeah. But for now, I mean, the problem is the measurement is so low. You don't have – well, first of all, it's, it's a very new technology. So right. it doesn't matter anyways. But then also the current method may be very different than the future method. Right. And then right. the measurement rate is so low, it's very – the measurement would be very noisy. Yeah, that makes sense. So, yeah. I, but, it, I mean, I think it's always going to be somewhat – it's going to be more risky than taking a plane flight. I can't – yeah, I mean, at least for you know probably our lifetimes, right? I, I mean, would, yeah, just the physical forces you have to overcome are much greater, and and you could assume that that always is going to incur higher risk, right? Yeah, I mean, eventually, I would think it would be naive to say it won't become easier routine, right? I think if history teaches us something, it's that whatever we expect to not happen, <laughs> it's well, happen. Probably, yeah. So whatever I say <laughs> will be wrong, but. I, I think it will become routine, but I think it will also, like, air flight will probably become much safer. So maybe future shuttle flights to the inflatable space hotel will be as risky as current airplane flights are. Oh, I see. That makes sense. I don't know. Yeah, we'll see. We'll, I'm making this stuff up tell. now. <laughs> see, if we did really good so, at this, we could, like, go back to this podcast and then, like, become oh, futurist. Because we could, yeah. like... Look, we predicted this was going to happen. We should be making bolder claims, Yeah, Jason. Yeah, totally. I think it'll happen tomorrow. <laughs> wow. Now, uh, actually, good question. Okay, do you think there will be humans in space, like, commercially in five years? I say five years. I say two. You say two years? Yeah. Let's just say less than five. If it's less wait, than wait, five, okay, you win. How, so you got to say how many... I don't know. Okay. I'm... I'm but it's, I, you, I feel you said so it very vague. It's got to be very specific, right? How many man days will humans be in space in five years? Okay. I will it be greater or less than 10,000? How many man days? So m oh, number yeah. of men or women times the number of total days. I'll put it to you this way. Okay. I think 1% of the population will have gone into space for a vacation um, oh, in, that a, in, far in a longer. year. And I think that that is going to be five years. Oh, really? That's really aggressive. Oh, okay. So I, 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 would talk, I was just thinking you meant like you could commercially. Like right now, if you wanted to buy your way into space, it kind of exists. But, I mean, it's not really commercial. I mean, it's custom. Oh, you I know, see. you got to go on the Soyuz rocket. But you don't and think do it would take five years to go That's what I was saying, two years. Two years basically for very rich people to be able to buy a ticket to space. Oh, but you're thinking it's going to take much longer. But to I think, yeah, I would say it's class. probably going to, yeah, it's like the greater than 50% of the population has access to, or, or to your case, 1% of humans will have recreationally traveled to space. 
You think that number is more than five years? Yeah, out? I think that's oh. more than five years. All right. Well, because also, I mean, there's a lot of people on our, you know, in the on the world who, you know, don't have a car, don't have access to clean running water, right? So like, you got to already yeah. those people in five years. I mean, they're going to go from that to recreational space flight. Uh, yeah. Wow, this I episode guess, is really like. <laughs> I mean, I feel really I guess bad I didn't now. think about all of the people in the world. I was only thinking about like the subset of people who were candidate like. Who'd want to go into space? You know. Well, you don't think those people want to go to space? I'm you don't sure think they, they do look up at the stars space. and and wish like, oh, I, could, I wish I could go there. Well, this guess, is really off topic now. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, we'll talk. We'll have to come back to that. Okay, but let us know if you find this interesting, or <laughs> tell us to shut up and keep to our uh, claimed expertise. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, speak of our claimed expertise. It is the tool, the tool of the show. Of the show. 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 So my tool of the show is something that I think is pretty freaking cool. It's a Ripple emulator. It's actually not a Ripple emulator, but it's called Ripple emulator. And what it is, I'm confused. It is a. Uh, it's pretty cool. It's an extension for Chrome, and uh, you put it. You know, you attach it, and it puts a button in the top right of your Chrome browser, and then you click the button, and you can actually simulate what the site looks like under different phones. Ah. Yeah, so you can click it and say Blackberry, and it'll show you what your site looks like. I thought like I was going to be able to drop a stone in a pond and you just and watch the ripples. The whole website I'm very confused. ripple outwards. Yes, okay. But it's pretty cool. This seems more see. useful. Yeah, yeah, it actually uses like the emulators of the devices and things like that. And, How fast um, is it? Is it pretty fast? It's pretty fast. It's, um, you know, it's, I haven't tried it on dynamic content. I've only tried it on, you know, static web pages. But um, but it feels very responsive. Have you tested for accuracy? Like take a device you own and like compare. Like no, I haven't done that either. Oh. So, <laughs> but sorry, I didn't mean to deflate your balloon, dude. <laughs> no, but so I haven't done like rigorous testing of this. But I have used it to sort of verify like a site I was working on that how it looked in Android. Oh, okay. And uh, you know I haven't checked pixel by pixel, but no, it no, no, no. Close. I didn't mean that. I just mean like yeah. Did it generally give you a better? Oh feel yeah. For, okay. Yeah. Now better than just resizing your window down to the right pixels. Yeah, yeah. Resolution. No, it definitely did better than that. Okay. Um, and so well, it's good tool uh, then, sir. <laughs> and so it covers like different browsers on different you know platforms and things like that. And it'll actually warn you if you have something that's let's say like Mac specific or, or desktop specific that like a phone won't know how to handle or things like that. So very yeah, cool. It's actually made by uh, or or it's made by a company that was bought by BlackBerry. So by RAM. So, um, so they should. Uh, it should be pretty well maintained and things like that. So, if you do any mobile development or you want to see how your website works on a on an Android or a BlackBerry or some other, check out this uh, Ripple emulator extension. I feel like I should make a joke about like rim stock price or something at this point. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to offend anybody. It's not a simulator. It's not <laughs> it can't do it all. <laughs> I, I feel like. No. Oh no, never mind. Poor Rim. I'll just. Uh, Remember when Rim went down and there were riots in yeah. London? Yeah. So Rim, like, so Rim. Aren't they in Canada? They're in Canada, but something happened to their London thing, and there were actually riots. Or no, actually the riots. Right, we are totally like making like <laughs> we don't have like a story about this or anything. Hang on. We're I'm gonna totally up. mess this up, dude. So okay. Uh, something about Rim riots. Okay. The UK riots, Rim, and the race price of price. Anyways, okay. so something yeah, Ripple happened. emulator. Check it okay. out. Bought by Rim. So what is your tool? Hopefully they didn't pay in, in, the in Rim stock. Yeah, this show is sponsored by Rim. <laughs> <laughs> sponsored by Rim's competitors. <laughs> oh, sorry. Mine is the very, very, very useful tool. I cannot get by without this. Really? This, if you don't have this, like I, I don't even know how you get any work done. Really? And that is the game Battle of the Bulge <laughs> for the iPad. <laughs> This looks awesome. So, so this is a uh, war game for your iPad. It does not work on iPhone. Does Do not work on Android. Android. Nothing. I, I'm a horrible, horrible person. Um, supposedly, I guess one is in the works. Oh, okay. But um, yeah. So this is a really, really, really awesome game. It uh, it's kind of like strikes an awesome balance between like a true war game. If you ever play like a real like war game with all the it little cardboard. Allies. No, 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 no. Like oh. I don't like the what is the name of that company that does all of them? Oh, I can't think of the Avalon Hill. 
with all the little cardboard oh, squares yeah. and the hex maps and like yeah, a yeah. book that's like 50 pages thick. Yep. Like, okay, if you ever play one of them, I never actually managed to play one of those, but <laughs> I've, I've seen, seen them. people playing them, yeah. And then like Risk or Access and Allies, which is kind of simple. This kind of like strikes a balance in between. So the nice thing is the computer handles a lot of the accounting, bookkeeping for you. They threw a lot of like really thematic elements into it. Huh. But yeah, it's like you can sit down and lose really easily. Like, you know, it's really fun to just drag the guys around and then completely you lose <laughs> because the game is really hard and I've never won, not even once. Oh, man. I've, I, I got a tie once. Um, but it's, it's actually really fun. And I've kind of always wanted to like imagine myself as being like an awesome strategy war game person. Like but I kind of find out, like, I'm pretty terrible oh. at, like, strategy. Even, like, you ever really like, the turn-based games, like uh, Final Fantasy Tactics yeah, or, like, yeah, you know, yeah. any or of these style. Advanced Wars. Yeah, or Advanced Wars. I'm terrible at all of those games. <laughs> but, like, I really, like, envision myself as, like, this awesome, like, game guy and, like, oh, really good strategy. I'm just terrible. Like, what in my it? old age, I've kind of... Oh, that sounds really oh. Uh But I just kind of, like, I'm embracing the fact that I'm... Like, I played this game... Not just like on the easy setting, and like I don't even, I don't even fathom like how I would ever beat it. One thing I've noticed is that some of these games demand a lot of micromanagement, and so like what if if you're like not specifically moving like each person, then like you can get burned just on. No, that. no. So this one, I mean, this one. Uh, so it's not like the individual. It's what they call like a squad. So oh, like you're okay. managing kind of like a squad. So and it's and similar to kind of Advance Wars is about the same level of... Oh, I I, we probably people don't even know what we're talking about. That's okay. So, you know, you're kind of moving the people around. And then there's, like, very complicated, like, conditions. And I think that's what I'm not accounting for. Like, oh, oh this is, like, an elite squad, but he's attacking somebody, like, in a forest. So, like, he's oh, got a defensive bonus for being in a forest. And I haven't... I've only played, like, five or six times, but I haven't yet gotten to that, like, oh, I need to be... I need to move my guy to the right to be on top of the hill so I can attack down onto the people as opposed to just attacking them straight and just like watching my people die. Uh, so it's kind of interesting if you have I an iPad. I mean never to go to war with you as the commander. Yes, you should not. You should not let me direct your war. I would not do well um, according to my previous experiences. Anyways. Um, we'll just train everybody to be hackers and we'll just do it from the safety of our desks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so people should check this out if they have an iPad, which greatly, I know, narrows down. It doesn't work on iPhone or iPod Touch. Well, we'll have to say as soon as it does. So, yeah. so we, but it, it is a little expensive at $10, but I found it like a, one of the games is like really, really well made. Not just like, oh, we're ported this over or whatever, but like this one's really well made and I really enjoyed it over the uh, Christmas break. Yeah, that sounds awesome, man. So is it easier to hack somebody if they're on a mountain or is that, do you pay a penalty for that? It depends on what mountain. Oh, that's true. Maybe it's Iron Mountain. <laughs> <laughs> because, like, if it's, like, uh, you know, NORAD, like, yeah. you know, deep room, that's probably pretty hard to hack. Yeah, exactly. Uh, also, if the mountain is very tall, connectivity might be bad. So it might be hard to hack them because you probably don't have a reliable connection to them. Ah, you just reminded me of something. Speaking of, of connections. Sorry, that was uh, a joke for everybody playing along at home. So somebody at work who's a hardware engineer just happens to sit next to me. My phone kept going off. And uh, I would leave my phone when I would, like, go to a restroom or a meeting or something, and my phone would go off, and he's getting annoyed with it. He finally, he took those static, the things that, like, if you buy a GPU or you buy a hard drive, oh, it comes in static, a static bag. bag. Conductive bag, He yeah. took, like, four of those, and he put one inside the other, and then he put my phone in that. And so it's he, basically a Faraday cage. <laughs> I didn't realize If he had that. grounded it, yeah, but... Pretty close. Yeah, I mean, and then he he, like, just closed the lid. He didn't tape it shut or anything. And my phone totally had no connectivity. Like, I did didn't he tell you he did it? No, did he, he just waited for you to come back. He just and, waited for me to come back, and I was like, looking for my phone, and I found it wrapped in static bags. But I didn't think that that would work, but it does. Wow. So, yeah. Yeah, I think it. I think it. Does. I mean, it really attenuates the signal very strongly. Yeah, yeah. I didn't. I don't I guess I don't know. So I used to think Faraday cage too, but then somebody told me. I said that one time, basically, like you said, and then I got a. You got an ear verbal full. lashing. Yeah, like someone <laughs> for who like, actually knows. What for, yeah, because the Faraday cage needs to be grounded. So if you think about it, essentially, oh. the radio waves are coming in. So if you had strong enough. A signal, it would uh, charge the bag. I'm butchering this because I know nothing no, about this. No, you know this. more than me. So. But like the essentially, the bag would start becoming an antenna because uh. you're able to manipulate the charge on the bag. Versus if it's grounded, every time the charge builds up, on it just it would, would just go straight into ground. That, yeah. That's my like. I probably butchered it. We're gonna have people email us and tell no, us no, no. I think that makes a lot of sense. sense. I mean, you probably know more electrical engineering than like 99.99 percent of the population. So I, no. So anyway. Thank you um, for that compliment. <laughs> it's totally Maybe? true. Think about it. Okay. So, okay. Time for 
Book of the show. B- 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 book of the show. Our newest. Oh no, I guess newest segment was question of the show. Well, yeah. book of the show. Book, book of the, the show, show is pretty awesome. So, my book of the show is. I have it right here. This sound is. Uh, here, here, maybe like drop it on the table. No, no, don't do that. Don't. Do it's that. pretty heavy. It's a hard cover. Um, this is reinforcement learning and introduction. So trees were killed to make that book for you. That's true. That's that's kind of sad. I'm sorry. I don't know. I didn't even, I'm sorry, guys. I haven't even finished it yet. So some of the trees died in vain. Oh. Yeah, especially that one in the beginning. Why are we... Oh. Anyways. We need to be more upbeat. <laughs> Reinforcement Learning and Introduction by uh, Richard Sutton and Andrew Barto. Um, so a little bit about reinforcement learning. You know, we were thinking maybe doing like a whole machine learning podcast, but um, just a quick synopsis of reinforcement learning. Uh, what makes it different? Um, you know, so traditional machine learning, you do the... oh. For example, like if, you know, so one thing they do is they measure like babies, right? They measure the distance from like, I think the baby's hip to their knee. And okay, so we switched from artificial, so real life, real doctors. Oh yeah, so real doctors. Okay, things. okay. And they measure like from the baby's hip to their knee. I shouldn't say real doctors, that sounded bad. Medical doctors. And, and that distance hip to they the knee. use to figure out how tall the person is going to be when they're an adult. Okay. And obviously it's not like one-to-one, there's some function that maps that. And so you could actually take a bunch of babies, measure them at their babyhood, measure them again when they're We should say doctors should take a bunch of babies. Don't try this at home. (laughs) (laughs) And then you can come up with some function using regression or something like that, like simple like machine learning techniques to figure out so that when you get baby number X plus one, then you know how tall they're gonna be. Okay, Yeah, yeah. So that's regular, you know, machine learning. Reinforcement learning is when you have to make a lot of decisions. So by contrast, let's say you want to have a machine like play checkers. So you make the very first move, but the problem is you haven't learned anything, right? The very first move doesn't tell you like, was this a good move, is this a bad move, right? So you only get a reinforcement. You only get like, you only get a value at the end, like when you've lost the game or won the game. Okay. And somehow you have to take that, like, oh, I lost the checkers game, I'm really disappointed. And like you have to like think about all the things you did and which ones of those caused you to lose, right? Or which things the opponent did, which were great for him, which caused you to lose. And vice versa if you win. Reinforcement learning lets you do that, that piece of it. I think I need to sit here quietly to <laughs> soak in. Okay. So it's not like, oh, I have all this data, all these like X, Y points, and I just like need to fit like a function to these points. It's more like I have all this data and only some of it I, I know was good or bad. So in other words, like all the last moves you played in all the games, which caused like the move which lost you the game, like you know that that move was bad or that move is part of a bad game. But you don't necessarily know all the moves that led up to it were bad. Some of them might've been great, but then you lost because of other reasons, right? Like two of the moves might've been great, but then the next 28 were bad, right? So reinforcement learning lets you do that part of the problem. And if you want an introduction to that, okay, okay. you can read this book. <laughs> I feel like I need an introduction to the, the yes, yes, I should read this book. <laughs> Another like simpler example would be if someone's on your website and uh, you know people are on your website, they're spending a lot of time, they're visiting a lot of links and they're having a good time. And then you make some changes. Let's say you make like, like 200 changes or a bunch of changes. And then people, they start just dropping off your website. Or they start, start not spending enough time on your website. Or maybe, you know, everyone who goes to this, like, everyone who visits sites A, C, and D on your website, like, in that order, they never visit your site again. So reinforcement learning will actually give you uh, those answers. So you could just put in everybody's sort of, like, their visit history through your website into a reinforcement learning algorithm, and it'll actually tease apart, like, what, you know, sites and what actions are good and bad. That so. sounds pretty cool. Yeah, it I feel does, like I should read this book. Does does let you do some really awesome stuff. I feel like I probably won't understand it though. No, this is How's an introduction. It, it like, okay, so but I, I've I've been told that before. <laughs> <laughs> Patrick skeptical. No, I, so I actually this is one of the first books I read, and uh, so if somebody learning. so take me for an example, then very very little, you know, artificial intelligence. Could I read the like? Does it contain? Do I need to know like previous artificial intelligence? No, to read this you book? can totally. So this is my first artificial intelligence book. Yep. This would be good. I mean, you might need to know the very basics of machine learning. Like, it might help to read Machine Learning and Introduction or something like that. Okay. But even if you didn't, this book, it has a bunch of really simple examples. Like, it starts with kind of like, you know, driving and like your commute time 
trying to estimate your commute time to work. So it's a very concrete example. And they kind of carry this example through the whole book. And uh, it, I think it starts off with, with you don't need a lot of knowledge. So is it written in uh, domain language or normal language? Like in other words, it, can I read it even if I don't fully get all the concepts while I still learn stuff out of oh, it? Oh yeah, or, okay, totally. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it has a few f equations in it, but it's not too math heavy. Okay. And um, It doesn't try to teach me through the equations. Right. Okay, I don't, totally. books like that I've tried. I, want to, I have trouble reading books like that. I just don't. I need to like have the concept told to me, like yeah. in, in plain words. Yep, it does words as pictures, and they have the um, uh, the first couple of chapters are available online for free. Ooh, so Maybe you should start kinda, with that. An introduction yeah. to the introduction. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Does this book have an introduction? I don't know. Well, is the first the few chap. Oh, first chapter is an introduction. It does have an introduction to the introduction. And with that, what is your Since book? Since I'm a show? slow learner, <laughs> I'm going to go with another fiction book. Okay. This one is Ready Player One by Ernest Cline. If you, this book uh, was actually really, really popular. I think it even made the New York Times bestseller list for a while. Um, and this is about uh, a year and a half old at this point. But this book is really, really a fun read. Wow. I had a good time reading this. This is very cool. enjoyable. And <clears throat> the the author of this basically took everything that he loved about the 80s and like put it into a book that was set in the future ah. and uh so i i kind of missed that boat a little like mm, you know I, there's no secret like i'm not i'm not that old so like i i knew most of the references but they were more like i kind of didn't know exactly what they were and there are a lot right. of references i'm sure i missed but you know i still did get a bunch of it like you know there's references to to pac-man and not just like references, but even just talking about Pac-Man and a lot of people trying to understand the culture about like Dungeons and Dragons and about these kinds of things. It's, it's really a good uh, story. I really enjoyed it. Uh, it wasn't like some science fiction you read where it's like, oh man, this is like really deep. It made me think about like the future and like, you know, about this stuff. It was just like a fun read. You know, you read a book and it's like really easy to read and really fun. This was this book. And once you start reading, it's like, oh, just one more chapter. I, I just want to find out just one oh, more man. chapter. Just one more chapter. Yeah, I've been looking for a book like this. Like I kind of want something more light. So I, I, I feel totally like this is it. This so up. I feel like, and plus with all the cultural references, it's kind of like just like a running joke almost, you know, like just like all this pop culture to various movies and games and you know, uh, one hit wonders from the eighties, nice. all those kinds of things. So I would definitely awesome. recommend this if you haven't read it yet. So I don't, I'm kind of out of touch also with the eighties. Like, would I still get enough of it? Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, I think it's a good book without that. Okay. So, cause you'll, I mean, you'll know stuff, right? Cause a lot of the stuff from the eighties still exists today. Like, I mean, you know what Pac-Man is, right? Yeah, yeah. you know, and you know what a lot of these things will be. So back to the future, you know, kind of has some, yeah, yeah. some stuff in there, I guess. Um, is that true? I don't remember. Anyways, yeah, the DeLorean is in it, apparently. Uh, well, that was something. Anyway, so there's a, you'll know stuff in there. And even if not, like it's still a fun read. Okay. And I, I went to a, a presentation the author actually did where, you know, he was like signing books and stuff. Oh, okay. And I was like, oh, okay, like, you know, this would be good. Like, I, I really like this book or whatever. So I went to hear him, hear him talk. And he was saying how that, you know, it was, the approach he took to doing this was kind of interesting. But he told that there were like teenagers who obviously, have, you know, weren't even alive in the 80s. And they read it, and they read the book, <clears throat> the ebook version, and have Wikipedia open. And every time there's a reference they don't get, they look it up in Wikipedia. <laughs> nice. And so by the end, they kind of – and this is actually really fascinating because it's similar to what happens – without giving away a lot – it happens to people in the book. So the people in the book is about kind of kids in the future trying to learn about 80s culture. Oh, I see. And so one interesting side effect is that really happened in the present. <laughs> yes. So like people <laughs> cool. right now are actually like learning about 80s culture to understand this book. Yeah, yeah. So anyways, it, check it out. It's pretty meta. I, I like it. I, it was a fun read. Cool. Yeah, I'll definitely read that. So on to the programming languages of today's show. That's right. So we picked a – we have three languages today, Jython, Clojure, and Scala. Mm -hmm. And all of these things have – in common that they are languages meant to, written to use the Java virtual machine. Yep. So the Java virtual machine is the virtual machine that Java runs on. Yes. <laughs> I love saying statements like that. So so when you write Java code and you run the Java compiler, it compiles it to the bytecode, right. which gets interpreted and run on the Java virtual machine, yep. which is was kind of Java's whole thing when it came out in the 90s was write once, run everywhere, yep. run forever. I mean, there was some some play on that. It was like you wrote your code 
as opposed to C++ where you might have to change based on your platform and know about Indianness and know about all this stuff, Java is like, I'm just going to write my code once and it's going to run everywhere. Yep. You know, just take it and just run it, run it, run it once once it's compiled, and even, it's good to go. Even on like a higher level, you know, C++ didn't really touch things like GUI. Like it was expected that if you wanted to make a GUI, you know, right. some user interface that you would have to hook into Windows. The you'd OS, ask, whatever your OS was. Yeah, you'd have to ask Windows or Mac or Linux for a window or a button and you'd have to write three versions, right? But with Java, they did all that hard work for you. So they wrote three versions of their GUI, and they had one common API for all three. And so you can take some some GUI program that you've written in Windows and just you know know that it'll run on Mac. I mean, the buttons might be a little bigger. You might have to do a little bit of tweaking there. But uh, for the most part, they've handled just about everything. So the JVM you know buys you a lot. We've talked about virtual machines in the past. Maybe we'll revisit it in the future. But this idea of the JVM is a defined machine, but it doesn't actually exist or doesn't have to actually exist. It's a theoretical machine, which is described and the the bytecode that is compiled down to and then interpreted and run is just like in a real machine to be executed with instructions and moving stuff to registers. Mm -hmm. But then the virtual machine translates those from itself to whatever current processor it's running on, which is why it doesn't matter if you're running on ARM because you're issuing the Java virtual machine the same instructions, and then the Java virtual machine knows how to, in turn, issue the proper instructions to the ARM processor that it's running on. Yep. yep. And so that's how you get that write once, run everywhere. And so all these languages that were built on top of that JVM kind of get that stuff for free. And like Jason, like Jason said, also get the built-in GUI stuff for free, you know, networking stuff, whatever's built for Java, they kind of get that for free. Yeah, even there's some things which, you know, kind of go unnoticed many times, but for example, Java has an awesome date and time library. <clears throat> so you can actually say, you know, uh, the time is like this many seconds since the epic, or that's, you know, people usually use UTC. Wait, but do you then, pronounce it epic? Yeah. I just pronounce it epoch. Oh, which one is it? Epoch. I'll have to look it up. I think it's so epoch. Anyways, I'll finish this thought and you can look it up. So. Uh, but you might, you know, you might have users who are in Greece or in the oh, Netherlands. Right. It is or, epic. I it's stupid. epic, yes. Or, or in the Netherlands or the U.S. or U.K., or whatever. You might want them to see the time, you know, that, that they're seeing on their clock, right? And you want everyone to see the right, the localized time for them. That's actually really, really freaking hard. You know, I mean, it, it seems super easy. But you think about, like, even in the U.S., like, we have daylight savings time. We have all these other issues. You have... You know, you have like, you have different you know time zones. You have rollover, and there's there's even like really wacky things that can come up. Like I'm having trouble thinking of one off the top of my head. Oh, like one for example is let's say you you say um, if you buy this product, it expires, you know, on the 13th. Well, like what does that mean? Does that mean you know 12:01 on your time, localized time, or is it you know this time UTC? Right, all this stuff can get really hairy. So you have to kind of get it right, but it's really nice when Java can do it for you. and uh, Or at least the stuff that also is built in Java or, or at least to run on the Java virtual machine does it for you. Yeah, exactly. Yep. And so kind of what we're getting to is all of these languages, not only do they run on the JVM, but they also can natively use all of the Java libraries. So the Java GUI, the Java date time, all of this stuff you get for free, um, which is pretty amazing. So the first up is Jython. Yes, J -J -J crazy, crazy name. Yeah, I mean, who would have, I mean, it took like pretty wild, like no one would figure out that it was Java and Python put together. It's just Wait, such what? a stretch. <laughs> yeah, this is actually Java and Lisp. No. So, so yeah, Jython is, so one thing about Jython that's kind of different, and you'll kind of sense a gradient when we talk about these, is um, Jython is very much Python. I mean, you can actually do import Python import statements and import Java you know, classes to get those benefits that we talked about earlier. But for the most part, you're writing Python, and many people use Jython, or sorry, many people um, compile regular Python scripts with Jython. So they just write them. regular Python scripts, and yeah. for whatever reasons, platforms, whatever, they'd rather run them on the JVM than using the Python equivalent. Right, like imagine if, you know, you're on ARM, well, maybe I'm not sure if the Python, you know, virtual machine compiles on ARM, but let's say you're on some crazy new architecture. You're a hardware engineer. You made this new processor that's totally wild. And um, your first step was to port the JVM? Of course. Okay. It's like what you do right after you get main okay. running on it. <laughs> 
Step one, MAME. Step two, JVM. I thought step, step one three, was profit. Doom. Everybody always makes Doom run on everything. Well, yeah. Actually, yeah. If you get SDL running, okay. which is the thing that MAME is built on, okay. you get Doom for free. Because oh. Doom is also built on SDL. I need to reprioritize actually, my life. Of it. <laughs> actually, I have a friend who's working on getting SDL on the boxy. A rooted boxy. Okay. So, anyways, we digress. So, um... You know, you get the, and the other thing is optimization. Like, you know, Guido is a super smart guy. Uh, you know, he uh, did a lot of cool stuff, but he probably, and his team and people who work on the Python VM probably don't have the resources as the people who work on the Java VM. Oh. You know, so the Java VM has just had crazy, and there's also a ton of research and literature on things that people have done with the Java VM to make it, you know, a little bit better. There's many different implementations of it. You know, there's like the Ice-T and the Open JDK version. There's Suns, there's you know, et cetera. Um, well, that's a good point. Yes, there are multiple JVMs as well. Yep. Yep, so that's a good point. We, I think we talked about that before. But yeah. P anybody who writes this layer to basically expose on the one hand an interface for the Java virtual machine spec, and then on the other side runs on whatever architecture, essentially can do their own JVM, pending yeah. all the proper licensing agreements, whatever, oh, yeah. all doing all, whatever policies. that, you know, because Java is partially sort of kind of open sourced, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. So there's all sorts of controversy in court cases, and we're not lawyers, so we won't no. see any of that. But no, we're not lawyer cats. But the other thing is, uh, you know, a lot of mobile, like Android, runs on Java. So in exactly. theory, Android can run Jython, Clojure, and Scala. I mean, I haven't. I tried know for it. a fact it runs Scala. Oh, we'll really? talk about that in a little oh, bit. Okay, later. but yeah. So, um, so you just get you get, you get a ton of stuff for free. So, so you know, writing Lisp, uh, or sorry, writing Python with uh, with Jython just gives you a ton of benefits, right? And almost no, almost no. And so, I mean, that's good that you don't. If you don't have to change anything, you could always try. Like if you're suffering a certain problem or want to run. I mean, you could always. It's worth a try, right? Yeah. Especially if you're on a mal supporter, not great supported platform, then yep. you know you don't have a lot of risk to trying it. Is what it sounds like. Yeah, totally. So the second one is closure. Closure with so, a J. So I think similar to your story, to the story. Well, your story. The, the story <laughs> with Python. Um, Jython. Wow. <laughs> Similar to the tough. story with Jython <laughs> is having Python run on the Java virtual machine. I, I Closure is, is very similar. Right. So this is running Lisp on the virtual machine. And you get all those nice advantages that we've already discussed, this is rehashing. And you're you're able to intermix the, the niceness of a functional language like Lisp that that gets you yep. and still have some of the use of the underlying Java libraries and JVM. This is kind of like one of those episodes of a show where they go back in time and like visit all the old episodes. <laughs> it's kind of like, it's sort of like, kind of like because of the way that we're talking about all these other languages. Oh, I see, because we're all talking about languages we talked about yeah. before. Yeah, but uh, yeah, definitely, you know, if you haven't heard the Lisp show, give it a listen. Um, but, you know, Lisp is awesome. It does some amazing things as incredibly fast hash tables and lets you Lambda expressions, all sorts of super fun stuff. But it's also very niche. Right, I mean, there are things that you don't want to write in Lisp. You don't want to write, you know, some like a file I/O library in Lisp is like painful, right? So, um, you know, you can actually um, integrate. You can go seamlessly between Java and any of these languages. So you can take the part of your problem that you're trying to solve that's very easily solved by Lisp, and you can do that part in Lisp. And then do the rest of your program in Java, and they'll just communicate with each other, and it'll work. It'll work very fluidly. The other thing is, I think Clojure also adds some pretty advanced stuff. Like I, I think they add like a software transactional memory, which oh, maybe we'll nice. talk about one episode. So they do add some things, and, and Lisp has all these dialects, I guess, are, are, are kind of what they're called. Mm -hmm. But Lisp has all these dialects, and Clojure, I, I don't know, considered one of them or not, but it, it does add its own set of flavor to what it kind of does better or different than the existing Lisp. In addition to all of the JVM advantages you get, and having the a macros set up where you're able to call Java APIs, you know, from your closure code. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, I did a lot of Lisp programming in college, and I never did anything with a GUI. Like, I, there are times I wanted a GUI, but I just, did, you know, with Lisp, it's like. If there was some way, it'd probably be some Lisp GTK, like crazy hackery that probably wouldn't work half the time, right? And it's just, it's just kind of, that stuff's super ugly, right? But, you know, the JVM has sort of taken a lot of that complexity away. So you could write, you know, a closure program that 
has like a GUI built into it and lets you like you know visualize results in a way that's more appealing. Uh, you know, and it'd be, you'd, you'd be have much higher productivity than if you're writing in straight list. And I guess, I, I mean, you, I remembered a point during this discussion about that running on the JVM also brings this uh, security. So when you run oh, a C++ true. application, you don't know what that, you're basically letting that, aside from what the OS provides, you're letting that thing do whatever you want, whatever it wants to. Yep. But the JVM, uh, barring recent uh, exploits that were discovered, <laughs> um, I mean, the JVM has this notion of security. So you're supposed to be able to run untrusted code. Right. And if you don't want to let that code access the file system, it's not supposed to be able to break out of that virtual machine. So it's not supposed to be able to do stuff you don't want it to do. Right. And so when you run Closure, for instance, in the JVM, you're getting that added ability to right. kind of have that feeling of security. I mean, there are whole teams from many different, like, you know, multi-corporate, you know, consortia to uh, that are looking into JVM security. There's probably next to nobody looking into Lisp, you know, the C Lisp security, right? So, so, uh, so yeah, you get the benefit of all these resources. So our final language is Scala. Scala takes a little bit of a, a, a different bent than these in that it doesn't port an existing language to right. the JVM or an existing language concept to the JVM. It instead tries to be kind of everything Java is, but even better. Yep. So it tries to be its own thing. And so some of the interesting things about Scala is that it's both functional and object oriented. So you can kind of like pick pick both of whatever you need from the strengths of both of those yep. in your code. It gets all these benefits we've already talked about, about really good compatibility with the existing JVM. And the nice thing about Scala being a new language and kind of trying to extend upon the Java syntax is sometimes writing Scala code, you know, I'm, I'm doing air quotes here, is as simple as just like making a very few modifications to existing Java code. Right. And then you, once you do that, you may be able to do some concept that would have taken you many, many, many lines of Java code and it's just a few lines of Scala code. Yeah, I mean, anyone who's done, you know, raw Java on Android has been through the pain of, of runnables. So Java has this thing called runnable and uh, the idea is, you know, this is something that you want to run in another thread. So a runnable, you know, on the surface, a runnable just has, is just a class with a run function. So there's not much to that. But the idea is many of these thread, like a thread pool in Java or, you know, a single thread, uh, if you want to kick off a thread, um, we'll use, we'll take a runnable as a parameter and then execute the run function um, in another thread. The thing about Android is Android doesn't want you to lock the OS, right? I mean, they don't want you to do something that paralyzes the person's phone. And so they really encourage you to do everything in other threads. And what this means is you have just tons of these like runnable, these like container classes that don't have any data in them. They're just classes so that you can call a run function. And your code kind of gets kind of ugly. It's very hard to write clean code this way. Well, Scala, because it has the option of being functional, sort of gets around this. I mean, functions become objects and you can just pass them around to different methods. So you could pass a function to a, uh, you know, around to, to the Android uh, OS and it'll run it. And it just makes the code look cleaner. So Scala is being used, um, <clears throat> the other thing about what functional programming gets you is a lot of, it lends itself to distributed processing yep. more readily in many people's opinion than you know, object-oriented programming, for instance. And so you'll see there are a number of, well, for, for several of these, but for Scala in particular, a number of very highly distributed web apps that use it. So um, Twitter has come out and said that they use Scala and they've actually really, like been big contributors. They released a set of um, learning guides for Scala if you're interested. Mm -hmm. So that's actually what they use for their new engineers. People who are experienced software engineers but new to Scala, that's what they use to teach them. So that's a recommended source of, of learning. Um, Foursquare um, is known to use specifically uh, one of the web frameworks of Scala, the Lyft framework. And so I'm pretty sure they probably help out contributing to that as well, but that's yep. something they've, they've come out and, and said that they use. And those are something that there are web frameworks for other languages and stuff, but many of these JVM-based languages do seem to have a strong web framework presence or yeah. really good web frameworks that seem really well supported. Yeah, I mean, one thing Java got extremely well is it was the, the whole web you know movement. Like Java was, was essential to that. I mean, they started JSP, they had... You know Tomcat, which is a fantastic you know web you know server container, um, and so you know anytime you can hook into Java, you can take advantage of all of this history. So the other thing, uh, 
you know, in the last episode we talked about Hadoop and HBase and all of these, you know, all of these libraries associated with big data. Um, all of that is written in Java, but if you're using one of these languages, you naturally can hook into oh, hook into those. Yeah. So you could write, uh, you know, a Hadoop job that runs on you know 10,000 machines in in Python or in Lisp or in uh, Scala. So. Nice. Yeah. Well, I think that wraps it up for this show. I mean, three languages which are interesting. Like, maybe that's a little bit of cheating because we kind of <laughs> so we kind of handled them together. But well, it uh, encourages people to go and watch those shows. So if you if you haven't you know listened to the episode on Python, uh, Lisp, uh, or Scala is actually based on Scheme, which is uh, probably something we'll cover in a future episode. But uh, but yeah, check out check out those languages and check out those shows. And uh, yeah, it's good times. Awesome. Well, I think that's a wrap. Cool. Have fun, everyone. The intro music is AXO by Binar Pilot. Programming Throwdown is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 2.0 license. You're free to share, copy, distribute, transmit the work, to remix, adapt the work, but you must provide uh, attribution uh, to uh, Patrick and I and uh, share alike in kind.